It is. All right. This is a lecture for my fifth hour class on March the 28th. When we left off the other day, we are talking about why, uh, even though the United States, when the war broke out, uh, the United States declared that it was uh, neutral, the, United, the people of the United States uh, favored uh, the, the allies in this war. And we talked about the fact that, you know, our British heritage, much of the heritage of the United States is English. Uh, the French were our first allies. Uh, the Germans had invaded uh, neutral uh, Belgium. That was a huge mistake. In fact, that may be because world opinion matters, uh, especially in war. You're watching that with Vladimir Putin right now. He's the all-time bad guy of the world. The Russian economy is in shambles right now. You can't buy a stick of bubble gum with a Russian ruble. may not be quite that severe, but it's pretty close. <clears throat> and it's all because... <clears throat> he took it upon himself to invade this country that had done nothing to him, and the world has rallied around Ukraine. Uh, world opinion matters, especially in war, and the, uh, Vladimir Putin's finding that out today, and the Germans found it out in 1914. The invasion of little Belgium made the Germans look like the bad guys, attacking a small defenseless country. They killed 6,000 Belgians in the first five days of the invasion. They did everything that Vladimir Putin, if you're keeping up with this, they did everything that Vladimir Putin is doing in the Ukraine. They burned towns, uh, they slaughtered people, they destroyed infrastructure, and, and I think this is where you said we left off the other day, the British and French yellow press, right, jumped on this. The yellow press was around, it's still around today. They exaggerated uh, a lot of the things that were going on, especially the French and the British newspapers. Um, one uh, British newspaper didn't talk about the uh, invasion of Belgium. They called it the rape of Belgium. Belgium. Did we talk about, you know, and, and you don't have to have these stories down, but this is just an example of what I'm talking about. One story that was completely untrue. One story that was completely untrue was that a young Canadian soldier was captured by the Germans and instead of taken back to prison camp, uh, he was crucified. Literally, that, that never happened. Another story was that the Germans were collecting the bodies of dead allied dead French and British boys, uh, and they had developed a process by which they could make soap out of human flesh. And, you know, the Germans were behind the lines showering up uh, essentially with the dead bodies of Germany. Only a barbarian would even uh, think of something like that. Of course, that's absolutely untrue. It's not true, uh, but that's the kind of propaganda. And, of course, the other, I think I might have said this the other day, but pilots flying over, dropping candy to the little children. Did we talk about that? Well, that the German pilots would fly over and little, and at first, the first time they flew over, they dropped candy. This is an example of propaganda. Did not happen, but the first time they flew over a Belgian town, Belgian town, they would drop candy, and the children would come running out. And then the next time the children heard a plane, well, of course, they would come running out for more candy, and they would drop candy. But this time, the candy was poisoned, and the children would die. Uh, didn't happen, uh, but uh, that's that's the kind of story that you've got coming out of Belgium that make make the Germans look like they're some sort of barbarians, Huns. That's what they call them, the Huns. And then, of course, the, one of the biggest mistakes that the Germans made was the execution of Edith Cavell. Write that down. Edith Cavell. E. Cavell. <clears throat> Edith Cavell was a British Army nurse. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the, there weren't a lot. When the Germans invade Belgium, the British had not had enough time to get a lot of troops over to Belgium, so there weren't very many British troops. But the Germans were driving the French and what British troops there were back through Belgium, uh, and they were uh, pushing them back so rapidly that the British and the French did not have time to uh, bury the corpses of their dead or to uh, collect uh, the wounded soldiers and transport them to safety. Uh, well, Edith Cavell here was a nurse, and she was in Belgium. She was on the ground in Belgium, right in the middle of this war. You notice that she's an older woman. She's the woman dressed in dark, and she was in charge of a squad of younger nurses. And Edith Cavell and her nurses volunteered. This was a very courageous thing to do. Edith Cavell and her nurses volunteered to stay behind uh, and go to prison camp, go to a German prison camp, uh, to help those wounded British soldiers that could not be evacuated. And so the British Army left her, and she stayed behind the lines, and she and her nurses were arrested, and they were sent to a prison camp. And at that prison, <coughs> pardon me, at that prison camp, she helped nurse wounded British soldiers back to health. But at, 
when they were healthy enough, get this down, she helped them escape. What she was doing behind the lines was helping British, helping British soldiers escape. And when the Germans found that out, they lined her up in front of the wall and shot her. Okay, this is in 1914. I know things have changed, but you know, this was just two years after the Titanic sank. And you know, the rule on the Titanic was women and children first. There were now, I'm not saying that everybody abided by that. At least one man uh, went, broke into a closet in an abandoned room as he was running desperately trying to find uh, a lot, and he dressed in women's clothing. He got in the boat and lived. But the general rule on board the Titanic was that the men stepped back, many of them did, step back and let women and children take their place. And in stepping back, they knew they were going to die. Uh, but that was the rule. Uh, anyone who laid a hand on a woman, uh, and I'm not saying that people didn't do that in 1914, they certainly did, but you were considered to be the lowest of the low if you hit a woman. Let me just tell you, gentlemen, if you hit a woman, you are low and you're a coward. That's a cowardly thing to do. Let me tell you something, ladies, don't... Uh, stay around and let some thug uh, beat you half your life. Say, well, you know, I'll reform him true love baloney. He'll beat you. You know, I showed you that picture of the, that little idiot, didn't I? Didn't I show those two that were on Facebook and the whole country was looking for her? Yeah, didn't I show you? Yeah, back earlier in the year. Yeah, they were, you know, and there they are smiling. Life is great the whole time. He was just pummeling her and finally killed her. And then he ran off into the swamp somewhere and killed himself, okay? Well, uh, you know, ladies, don't let that happen. Don't let that happen to you. But anyway, when the British shot, the, or excuse me, when the Germans shot this woman, get this down, uh, that went beyond the pale. That crossed the red line. The civilized, quote, civilized, by that I mean the law-abiding world, looked at her, looked at, look at her, her death and what the Germans had done, and essentially said, it's true. The Germans really are Huns. And of course, what did this make the British and the French look like? It made the British and the French look like they were uh, truly fighting to save civilization. That the Germans were Huns and the British were the only, th and the French were the only thing between them and civilization. Okay. Well, of course, get this down too. When you talk about why did the Americans support the um, Allies, the war was good for the U.S. economy. We've already talked about this. But uh, we sold weapons to both sides. We were literally the merchants of death before we got into this war. To a degree, sad to say, we are still the merchants of death. We arm the world today. Uh, we sold weapons to Germans and British boys to kill, uh, uh, me, I mean, British and French boys to kill German boys and vice versa. In fact, one American newspaper, and this is an American, this isn't some foreign newspaper writing about the United States. This is an American paper that wrote this in 1915, and I quote, 10,000 German widows, 10,000 German orphans bear the legend made in America, end quote. Uh, so we were, we were uh, arming the world uh, to kill uh, themselves. Well, meanwhile, get this down. So while all that's going on, you know, the, 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 the Germans are stopped on the Western Front. There's the Western Front. If I can go back to that. There's the Western Front. And both sides dig in. We've talked about this, right? The Western Front, both sides, and, and the lines never move. And here's the way the war is going to be fought. Now, I've got a little film clip. Have any of you seen the movie War Horse? War Horse, well, you ought to watch that. I think it's worthwhile, and it's a good, good storyline. And uh, once in a while, Hollywood gets it right. But I think there's a good little scene in here about trench warfare. Write that down, trench warfare. And when I'm talking about trenches, I'm not talking about a little hole in the ground. <clears throat> the World War I trenches were as deep as this room is, okay? They were that deep. You had to have a ladder to get in and out of the trenches. And <clears throat> they're this wide, okay? They're this wide. A lot of them had wooden floors. Look, uh, people are gonna, people are going to dig 40 feet beneath the ground. That's this building. is 37. This building you have is 37. There were command posts 40 feet beneath the ground. They got they build the trench. They build the trenches. Uh, they have underground command posts, they have underground hospitals, they have underground munitions, they've got underground kitchens, they've got... Uh, what happened essentially is for four years, on both sides, millions of men burrowed down into the earth and lived there like a mole, okay? And here's the way the war was fought. 
there's a there's a picture there. You can see here's the front line trench, and there are all these connecting trenches, and then the same thing here. But I think I can maybe show you a little better. Here was the British front line. Uh, here was the German front line. Uh, you've got this deep, deep trench, okay? Let me just see. There, there's that sh trench looks like it's been shelled, but you can kind of see there the trench. Uh, and that is connected to a trench, and here are reinforcements here. And then that is connected to a trench. Uh, artillery here. And then that's connected to a trench. This is an aid station or a hospital trench here. And then that's connected to a trench. Uh, and there's a, there are kitchens for hot food, okay, uh, that's set up to the front lines every day. And it just goes on and on and on and on. It's not just the front trench. It just goes on and on for miles. Out in front, there's a great swirl of barbed wire. Now, this morning, someone in class said, like, razor wire. Yeah, that's exactly, except th these barbs are that long. Uh, and they're twisted out there. And over here on the other side, they've got their wire. One of the most dangerous jobs in World War I, if these guys are going to attack these guys, they had men uh, wire cutters. That was a terribly, you know, you go out in front of the troops, you get out and under fire, you're trying to cut that wire. Uh, and make a way for your troops uh, to get at the enemy over there. Out in the middle, write this down, was no man's land, okay? No man's land. And the way the war was fought was like this. For days and days and maybe even weeks would go by, and there wouldn't be any action. One of the worst, one of the worst enemies that soldiers had in the war, I don't care if it's World War I, all wars is just plain boredom. You go watch the movies and you think it's just one action film moment after another. No months sometimes will go by, and there isn't any movement by the enemy. But then all of a sudden, one day, the British would open up with their artillery, and they would fire. For two or three days, they would pound the enemy lines, and then all of a sudden, the shooting would stop. Uh, just as soon as it, just as, as quickly as it had begun, it would just stop. Uh, and then you would hear whistles blowing on this side here because they're going to do the attack, and they have these long, so the guy in this little film clip I'm going to show you has that, uh, but a little, and it's a very shrill whistle, but you would hear whistles blowing up all along the line, and that was to get ready to attack, and then someone would say, get this down, over, I want you to write this down, over the top, over the top, and they would go across, they would march across no man's land, okay, and they would get about halfway, and the Germans would open up with the weapon that killed, what was the weapon that killed most of the people in World War I? The machine gun. By the way, the machine gun in World War I had a range of 3,000 yards. Three, that's, that's 30 football, they can start killing you 30 football fields away. Think about this, think about this. The last major war that had been fought in the world was the Civil War, and the killing range of a rifle, they didn't have machine guns, but the killing rate was 600 yards, and that shocked the world. By World War I, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, World War I, which is about 50 years after the Civil War, uh, 3,000 yards, they could start killing you. And they would go, and they would be slaughtered. Very few of them would even reach the enemy lines. They wouldn't achieve a breakthrough. And after an all-day attack, the survivors would be thrown back in their trenches. And then nothing would happen for a few weeks, and all of a sudden the Germans would start bombarding the British lines, and they would repeat the same thing. Thousands would be killed. None of the Germans would reach the British lines. The survivors would be thrown back in their trenches, and then everything would settle down for a month or two more, and they would do it again. And get this down. That's what they did for four years on the Western Front. Get this down. That's the way the war was fought. Millions die and no one ever achieves a breakthrough. Millions die in, the, in either side uh, um, achieves a breakthrough. <clears throat> There's some guys going over the top. Those look like Americans. There's No, those are Americans. And that guy right there has just been hit. His helmet's already off. His head's down, probably killed. He's in the process of falling right there. And there they are going through, trying to get through their own barbed wire. Under fire. That's an actual combat photo of World War I. There's a guy trying to stomp down the barbed wire so he can get it 
and get a clear feel to run rather than sitting there bogged down in the barbed wire, which is, you know, well, there's a trench. Not a very good one, but there's a, a trench. There are some dead Germans in a trench. You see, you got their shovel. You were constantly trenching and reinforcing your trenches. <clears throat> and there's something else, too, that water there, it rained on the Western Front. And, I mean, like I say, a lot of the, eventually they start putting down wooden floors in those trenches. But a lot of people just stood in water. 18, 19, 20 years old, your age, stood in water and stood in water. And they got leather boots on, but eventually the mud and the water will seep through. And they get a thing called <clears throat> trench foot. Where it, trench foot, you, if you could just take someone's foot with a trench, grab their ankle with their foot here and shake it, most of the meat would fall off there and there would just be a bare skeleton there. It literally rots your feet. There's only one thing to do for trench foot, and that's to cut it off. And that's why you can go to New York and Chicago and London and Paris and Berlin after the war. And on every street corner, it seemed like there were 18, 19, well, there were 20, 21, 22 year old young men standing with no feet. Okay. And that's, that's just one of the hazards of combat. You're not actually being shot at. You're not actually being shot. At. You're just having to be in that mud up to your ankles day after day after day and week after week. Okay. Uh, there's the World War I machine. That was water cooled. If you didn't keep water pumping to it, it would get so hot that you couldn't shoot it. Uh, that's that's the number one killer in World War One, right there. Like I say, it's got a range of between two and three thousand yards. There are the trenches right there today. Okay, that's you know they haven't gone away. That's what's left of the trenches in World War One. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles of trenches. You can go over to Belgium or you go over to France uh, to walk through the trenches. I just urge you to be careful because uh, periodically some group like those people right there, a tourist, are walking along and they just happen to step on a German mine that's unexploded or a British mine or a French, and it blows them to kingdom come. Uh, or a farmer in Belgium or Germany or France, he's out there on his tractor and he's tilling his vineyard with his disc and his disc hits an unexploded shell from World War One, blows him and the tractor to kingdom come. Which that means this, 104 years after World War One, people are still dying as a result from the weapons, the weaponry of the first of the First World War, okay? Still dying from the weaponry of the First World War. By the way, when these men first attacked, uh, at first there was no fear. At first there was absolutely no fear. Okay, they're excited. They're ready to go on both sides. Uh, and the whistle would blow and they would go up the ladder uh, and uh, just go wrong, just sweeping across the field. Nobody's crouching down at first. Uh, the national sport of Europe is football, what we call soccer. And there was one British regiment, uh, the first time that it ever attacked early in the war, I'm talking about 1,200 men sweeping forward. First time they ever attacked, just to show the Germans how little they feared them, they kicked the soccer ball back and forth between the lines as they went across no man. Look, they're supposed to have killed. They don't do that again. A lot of British officers refused to carry a weapon. In those days, it was stylish for young men to keep, where, have a cane, a uh, mahogany cane with a gold head on it. That's just kind of a, what you what you had, you know, not because you were old and decrepit and you needed one, but you just sort of swung your cane merrily along as you went walking down the street. Uh, a lot of British officers refused, you know, they, they, they said, we're not afraid, you know, this is going to be a piece of cake. So they just stuck their cane under their arm like this and got out in front of their troops and just strolled across. And most of them didn't come back. They didn't do that. They didn't do that a second time. So uh, war in the trenches is bloody uh, and it doesn't have any effect on the outcome of the war. Let me show you this uh, little film clip from uh, War Horse. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> if I can take it out. Could uh, you get the light over there, please? I think you can see it a little bit better with the, in, with the lights out. Uh, these are British soldiers <laughs> at the Battle of the Somme. We'll talk about the Battle of the Somme. This is part of that movie. Andrew is good. Andrew! Nobody's retreating today. Andrew! Andrew! Nobody is retreating today! Music to go to war to the back time. Watch 
watch his whistle. did the same thing a couple of weeks later. It was a very futile war. It's, a, it's an enormous waste of life but for no for no good reason. And 40 million people, 40 million people died in, in that war. Get this now as well. It's also, we've talked about this, it's a war of new weapons. We've talked about the machine gun, but there are some other weapons too. One is gas, okay? You know, the Weapons of World War I were so deadly that uh, after the war, the nations of the world, the, quote, civilized, law-abiding nations of the world, met in Geneva, Switzerland, and they uh, outlawed some of these weapons. Gas is outlawed today. In fact, if you're keeping up with what's going on in the Ukraine, you know, good news today, I think it's good news. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it looks like the Russians were going to take the Ukrainian capital. The Ukrainians have not only stopped them, they pushed them back 40 miles. You can argue this morning, this afternoon, that Ukraine is cautiously optimistic that Ukraine is winning this war. The danger in that, though, is that uh, you know uh, uh, you, you don't want to push a dictator to corner. In other words, if, if Putin is defeated, you want to give him a way out because no telling what he'll do. And right now, there's fear that he might use chemical weapons, okay, which were outlawed after World War One. Gas is a chemical weapon. I uh, got this down. They had two kinds of gas, <clears throat> two kinds. Those are two American soldiers in their gas mask, and you can notice they've got the gas mask on their mules, too, okay? <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, there's mustard gas, and I think mustard gas uh, cooks your lungs. Uh, and uh, there is uh, chlorine gas, and uh, that, I'll have to look these up. I'm not up on my uh, the effects of gas, but... Uh, <clears throat> Those two are the type, and I think chlorine gas uh, affects your nervous system, but both of them will kill you. Mustard gas, and if I'm wrong on this, I'm wrong on it. But mustard gas, if you get a whiff of that, you inhale that, uh, your lungs, and you look at you, you know, your, your lungs are as healthy right now as they'll ever be. You get a good whiff of mustard gas, and your lungs, I mean, they're not, not much, just a good whiff of mustard gas, and your lungs would look like the lungs of someone who had smoked three packs of Lucky Strikes a day for 40 years. It'll kill them, just dead, or dead as a hammer. The first time that gas was used in warfare was at a battle called Epress. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the battles of World War I. I'm going to mention them, so someday in your academic future, if somebody stands up and talk, if the professor's talking about the Battle of Epress, you know it was in World War I instead of Vietnam. But Ypres, uh, 1915, in Belgium. And there were some Canadians, you know, Canada had been part of the British Empire. There were some Canadians who were fighting in the British Army, and the Germans fired. The Germans were the first to use gas. They fired these gas canisters. Never had been used in war. They didn't know what it was. Gas canister fired out of an artillery piece. It hits the ground and bounces. And then all of a sudden, out of each end, it starts hissing, and out comes this grayish, yellowish, black gas, and it starts to spread. And of course, the soldiers, the Canadians watching that, they saw it hit, and they said, what in the world is that? And they noticed that as that cloud engulfed their fellow soldiers as it was rolling toward them, their soldiers would grab their throats and fall down and start to die. There was one young officer there who had paid attention in chemistry class because he knew exactly what it was, and he immediately pulled his handkerchief out of his pocket and he peed in it, and he held that to his nose like that. I see people go, ooh, 
smell pee. Well, your choices are smell a little pee or die. Which one are you going to choose? Human urine has ammonia in it, and it acts as a it can act for a while as a filter to gas. Okay, and uh, he survived, and I'm sure other people followed suit. <clears throat> but by uh, 1916, that's what you see right. By the time the Americans enter the war in 1917, you know you're going to war with a with a gas mask. And also, gas also causes blindness. This is a famous painting. I think it's by a man named John Singer. Sergeant, and it's uh, I think in the British uh, Imperial British War Museum in London. But you see all these young men who are blinded, and there are thousands of people after the war. Just think about that your age, your whole life, and you lose your sight at any age, but you especially as young and promising as you are. And they got their head on the guy's arm, uh, shoulder in front of them, trying to stumble back and make it back to the uh. Uh, aid station. So that's a famous painting from the First World War, but it's it's a fact. Also, airplanes. Got this down. Airplanes. <clears throat> Pilots. Well, you know, the, the Wright brothers were the first to fly in 1903. Eleven years later, World War One breaks out and planes are used for the first time. There is a British plane. You can see that it's a biplane, two sets of wings. That's a British plane. If this were in color, that circle there would be red, white, and blue. There's the pilot, open cockpit, uh, and he's got his uh, machine gun up there, okay? Um, these pilots, get this down, they were the most romantic figures of the war uh, because the plane was a relatively new thing. These guys were viewed like the astronauts who walked on the moon. And they're going to wear leather caps. You've seen this before. I mean, wear leather caps. And uh, they have a long silk scarf blowing in the breeze that their girlfriend or their wife or their mother or someone who loved them wrote, uh, made that for them. Uh, and they get up in the air over the trenches. They'll come out over no man's land and they will fight dog fights. In fact, they often challenge each other to a duel. Think about this. A German officer would simply send word over to the British lines, you know, I'm such and such and such and and tomorrow at 4 o'clock, I'll be over no man's land. I challenge any British flight pilot to a duel. And so they would fly around. And these things, they don't fly much higher. They fly some higher. But they really don't fly much higher than the lights out there on the football field. A little bit higher than that, but not much. And uh, they would just be flying around. And they would fire at each other. These two guys that challenged each other, they would fire at each other with pistols. Uh, they uh, carried their bombs in a basket in their lap between their knees. And they would fly over and look down and see a trench and just drop one, and of course, the soldiers down in the trench, they get irritated, this guy up there dropping bombs down on them, so they would just take their rifle and shoot them, okay? Blow them out of the sky, literally, all right? So, um, you know, these pilots, these pilots were uh, the real, they're real heroic figures. Um, like I say, this was a new weapon, and at first, and we'll stop here, but at first, just a second, first, no one thought about synchronizing the uh, propeller. See, the machine gun's going to fire like that, and there's the propeller. Well, you know, you've got to synchronize that because nobody thought of that. And so here goes a German plane with a British pilot bearing down on him to shoot him, and the British pilot opens up and shoots his own propeller off and crashes to the ground, okay? So they have to go back to the drawing board and, and synchronize those so they won't shoot their own planes in. Well, write this down, and this is where we'll start tomorrow after your quiz. Uh, flying aces, okay? Flying aces. And when we come back, we will take it up there. Get some point. Look over your notes before you come to class. Get some point. Teacher, just a question I need the following students to report out front. Okay, and then I'll be Out front of the high school office to visit with Miss Graham. 